And thank you for just being part of that with me. Um, we are going to be in the lectionary, uh, and so I get a chance to kind of kick us off with this with this passage this morning in a kind of a, a reflection for us, if you will. Uh, there was this man, and the man's name was Paul. Many of us have heard of Paul. Some of us haven't. Um, Paul is the author of the book we're going to be in today. It really wasn't a book. It was a letter. But I want to kind of ground us in the actual history of that event. Paul, the man, is a real historical man. Goes through this incredible conversion. Um, is primarily about, you know, the early beginnings of these followers of Jesus, um, the early church, as we would call it, the early fellowship. Um, Paul is Jewish and really intensely Jewish. Now, so are all the followers of Jesus, um, and they're beginning to figure out what it means to be the followers of the way, is what it was called. They weren't called Christians yet at that point. They were Jewish brothers and sisters, siblings, who are following Jesus, who are following his ways, who are being faithful to Jesus and obedient to Jesus. And Paul was trying to stamp that out, like literally killing folks, trying to stamp that out. And along the way, has this incredible conversion experience and goes on to be one of the most influential, we'll call it today, church planter, but that's probably not the right term. He goes from city to city to city talking about this good news, talking about this Jesus who refused to pick up a sword, who refused to do eye for an eye, who, who led completely differently, who was executed on a cross by some state-sanctioned um, Roman politics, some Jewish politics that got mixed up in that, and stayed on that cross for you, for I, and totally demonstrated a different way to live and to love. And so Paul would go preaching the news of Jesus in all these different synagogues and towns, uh, and people would decide to follow, and they would be gathered into these small communities of people. So not like what we know today, like not like church planter today, which is like, hey, buy a building, open up a middle school, and have hundreds of people. It wasn't like that. He was preaching the good news that Jesus defeated death and then letting it form its own community. Well, Paul was in this town called Corinth, and, and Corinth would be like uh, a modern day, um, there's a picture of it, and, and I've had a chance to be there. Like that street that you see on the screen right now uh, would have been like our version of a commercial mall with all the best stores in it, with all the best goods in it, with all the best trades in it. And on a hill, kind of right behind, was a giant temple to Aphrodite. And so kind of around that, uh, she was the god of beauty and sex, and Corinth kind of became like this modern-day version of Vegas. Like, that's the best way to kind of describe Corinth. And right along this strip, about three-fourths of the way down, is the first kind of Corinthian fellowship church. And I think that's where Paul was when he wrote what we have before us today. And he's writing to another group of people in Rome. And in Rome in that time would be like a modern day Washington, D.C. I mean, it was like the center of power. All kinds of empirical things were happening from, from Rome. Um, and in Rome, there's these multiple fellowships of 10, 15, 20 in this house, or 10 and 15, 20 in this house. And they were multis of multis. They were Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, women, men, children of God, all different economic states, all different languages, because Rome, again, was like the center of the empire. It was like Washington, D.C. for us, where everything kind of came through there politically. Everything was laced up in Rome. And Paul is writing to Rome. And he's writing this giant letter from Corinth to Rome, because he hopes to come visit on his way to Spain. And he's writing, and they have their own issues, as every faith family does, and he's writing to encourage them. He writes this, like, this long section uh, and so we have it as we have today in the New Testament, we have the book of Romans, which meant it was written to the people of Rome, that churches, multiple, more than one, there was probably about 20 of these different churches kind of all throughout Rome. Um, and they were experiencing all kinds of things, by the way, like they were having a hard time loving each other, which is part of just being human and being alive. They also were, even at that point, being, being relatively persecuted. Um, there was a piece of Rome that said, you had to bow down and say that Caesar is Lord, uh, and they would refuse. They would walk around saying, Jesus is Lord. We can't bow down to anything else. And um, they had all these different moments, which led to 100 years later, many of them being martyred and persecuted. And, and we've 
heard about different pieces of that with Nero in, in different ways. So Paul is writing them, and he writes these first 11 chapters as we have it. So this first part of the letter, the chapters weren't in there when he wrote it. In that first 11, what Paul is doing is writing over and over and over again in so many different ways how much God loves them, how much Jesus has done, how much Jesus went over the top for them, the good news of God is on their side, the good news of God is on the side of the slave as well as the wealthy, the good news that God is on the slave on the side of the Gentile. And he's writing all these amazing things about how hey, you didn't deserve that, you didn't earn that, that's not how this works. He's fighting against all the philosophical kind of times of the day. He's writing, hey, love Jesus, he's gonna come through for you, don't bow down to the empire. You know, all these different pieces, God loves you, trying to fill them up, like I'm trying to fill you up with how much God loves you right there, the way you are just today. You don't have to earn that, nothing you can do to deserve that. Um, it just is how God feels about God's children, that God, Jesus went so far as to die on a cross, just to go through the process of proving like, this is how much I value you and love you no matter what, no matter what. And then he turns in chapter 12, and you get this verse. I mean, there's a kind of this serious like, turn, and I want to share this verse with you in Romans chapter 12 as we head towards Romans chapter 13. I think it'll come up. Romans chapter 12. Here it comes. There you go. So the therefore is about these first chapters, about how much God has poured out mercy and love and grace on all of us. He says, therefore, I urge you, first pres family, Church of Rome, brothers, sisters, siblings, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, to offer your work, to offer the work of your hand, not just your soul, not just your Sunday, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This, this is your true and proper worship. Therefore, put it into action. Therefore, go to orthopraxy. Therefore, offer your bodies, not just your gifts, not just your finances, every single part of us as a response to how much God has poured out into us this agape love. Do that work. Do not conform church in Rome to the patterns of the empire and the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to see what God's will is, to walk humbly, to do justice, and to love mercy. Therefore, I urge you, that, and that's the work before us, and then it plays itself out in Romans chapter 13, which I want to share with you, like, like the how. But on the way there through 12, I just want to read a few of the things that he's saying, look, this is how you, you offer your body. Let your love be genuine. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Love one another with an incredible affection. Outdo one another in showing honor to all. That's a great thought, right? How do we show honor to those who we don't necessarily always show honor to in our current culture? Contribute to the needs of all and show a radical version of hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. Repay no one evil for evil. This is all in chapter 12. He says, what does this love look like? How do we, how do we become? What's this transforming of the renewing of our mind? How do we offer our bodies as living sacrifices in response to the work of how much God loves us? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If thirsty, give your enemy something to drink. Wouldn't that be a radical way to live out God's love for us and God's mercy and grace to us in our current divisive climate? Don't be overcome by evil. It's present, it's out there, but overcome evil with good. And I share all of this with you so we can center in on our passage because we, whenever we look at the scripture, we have to look at it as a whole. You don't get to like piece it up. And so how do you have Romans 13, verse eight from our lectionary? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And let me show the one after it, if, if that's possible. Um, I know there's another verse. And this is why I, I just felt this was so powerfully to me this week. Then I'll go back and talk about, this. live a few last thoughts for us. Love does no harm 
to a neighbor. And neighbor is defined by Paul. It's also defined by Jesus as literally any other human. Love does no harm to another human. That our response to God, our worship that's pleasing, is to do no harm to another. Therefore, love is the fulfillment that God is love. Love is the fulfillment of the law, of all the scripture, all the work that God has been doing, all the Old Testament economic work, all of it comes into this. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of it all. So it leaves me a couple of thoughts I want to talk about as we kind of lead into communion. One of which is this. I, I was really wrestling through that language that let no debt remain outstanding. And so what Paul is saying is just like, look, when you have taxes, when you have mortgages, when you have loans, when you have credit cards, pay them off as fast as you can. Let no debt remain outstanding. That's a healthy way to live, to set us free to love. But then he writes this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt. And you have to play with the Greek a little bit as you study it. But here's what Paul is saying. He says, look, you can pay off your taxes. You can pay off your mortgage. You can pay off your credit cards. But you will never be able to pay off the debt that we owe our fellow brothers and sisters and siblings of love for them. That debt can't get paid. It's an ongoing, continual debt. That that is how we express our love for God. gets expressed. Chapters 1 through 11 are, are, are Paul saying, this is how much God loves you. While we were still yet sinners making mistakes, all these things, and he gets to verse 12 and he says, this is how it plays itself out. Um, many of you know, some, some of you don't, but I've shared some, um, that my father and I don't have the best history. My dad uh, left, primarily left. I mean, there was little, these little moments of emails and kind of random visits, but primarily left my brother and I when we were 13. And so one of like, the stories that's so evident to me that actually is, uh, is hard for me is that when I got to college, like because I, I didn't have anybody in the house, I had my mom who was beautiful and brilliant and my, oh, like a lot of my everything, single mom working hard to make it work, I didn't know how to shave when I got to, <laughs> when I got to college. And so I was shaving the wrong direction and every single week tearing up my neck with razor burn until one of my roommates helped me for multiple years, like it really hasn't been involved in, in very heavily in the life of my grand, of my kids and, and all these different pieces. And then about three years ago, called and said, Jake, I need you. I've been reflecting on that work. And my, my wife and I went and got him from where he was and brought him here to kind of live in Hayward and, and be with us. And we've been working over the last three years, my dad and I, on trying to make this work. Um, I've been reflecting on this passage because I remember what someone said to me and I said, Jake, you don't owe your dad anything. You've done what you can. You've done your part. You've done, you know what I mean? Like what kind of would have made it equal? And that was his exact language. His exact language was like, dad, Jake, you don't owe your dad anything. But when I read this passage, what I hear is Jesus saying to me, Jake, I guess in some sense that's right. That's human right. But... There's a debt that's ongoing. That if you're going to say you're a follower of Jesus, right? Like Jesus' work ends up on a cross with broken body and spilled blood. You're right. In a lot of human sense, I don't owe my dad anything. He wasn't around. I could be angry and I could walk the other way and I could dismiss. But I think very clearly what Jesus is saying to me in this passage and throughout the entire piece of scripture is that debt is ongoing, Jake. There's a continuing debt of what love and grace and mercy looks like for you to keep reaching into and keep paying because that's what I did for you. That's what God did for all of us. And it's hard. I'm not saying that's easy. It's been a terrible, like it's, been like it's been super difficult to walk through all the emotions of that and processing that. And I don't say it cleanly and I don't say it like with triteness involved in it. But I do say that it's the biblical mandate of followers of Jesus is to figure out how we sacrificially love. And that's what he's saying. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another fully and sacrificially. 
And that word in there is agape, and I think it's important to talk about. We've talked about it a little bit before, but if you're new, I want to engage it. We have so tragically misunderstood what love is in this current world. When we say to somebody, I love you, sometimes we mean agape, but Greek has all these different levels of it. But oftentimes when we say to someone, I love you, uh, we really mean I'm lonely and I want you to comfort me. Or what we really mean is I'm attracted to you, I'm desirable to you, I would love to get with you, but you want something from that relationship. That when we say we love somebody, we're actually looking to extract something, like if I do this for you, then you do this for me, and we work it out. That is not love. It's not what it is. Like our current version is like love is about wanting or desiring or controlling even. We have it so connected to like romance and rom-coms and and TV. I don't want us to lose sight at the reality that the love that we're being asked to perform here is a choice. And it's a choice. That's what God is asking us to make. The kind of love that Jesus models for us, that the apostles taught us to practice, is a kind of love that simply gives to another person without any wish to get anything in return or because they did anything for us. Two last thoughts. Love does no harm. Love is an unpaid debt that we will not be able to pay off no matter kind of how it goes. And love does no harm to neighbor. We do no harm, whether complicitly or implicitly. The ethic in our everyday decision-making has to be as followers of Jesus. Therefore, as those who know the love of God, therefore, when our neighbors are being harmed, whether through direct incident, when our neighbors, any human, are being harmed, whether through direct incident or because of our lack of getting involved, our lack of getting engaged, our silence, whether by complicitly or by omitting something, by commission or omission, Love does no harm to our neighbor. If our shalom, if our uh, peace comes at the expense of another. So I think Paul wants us to answer the question. The first one is, no, no, there's a debt of love that will never get fully repaid. We have a continuing debt to pay. There's a love that does no harm to us and our faith community, but beyond the walls of that. A love that does no farm in our neighborhood. We have to think about how we purchase things globally, how we purchase things locally, how we live globally, how we live locally. And the last one is that love, as Paul says in this passage for our day and from Romans, love is the fulfillment of the law. That where the Holy Spirit is taking us as a people and as individuals is to this fulfillment, is to this fullness of the knowledge of God. And so where God is taking us is that agape, sacrificial love is the fulfillment of what God is doing. We read in Psalm 119, Lord, teach me your precepts. I want to find your precepts. They're the key to life. Well, God has given it to us in the Old Testament. He's given it to us in the New Testament. He's given it to today in our passage that where God is taking us, that love is the fulfillment of those, pro- those precepts, that Old Testament work comes into this place. A love does no harm to neighbor, and it's a debt that can never be fully repaid. Why is that so critical for us? Because that's who we're meant to be. That all the great writers, all the great sages will say exactly the same thing, that we find ourselves when we give ourselves away. That call and that command sounds so easy at times, but I know, brothers and sisters and siblings of mine, that it is so difficult. It has not been an easy journey with me and my father. We are finding our way through. I walked into his room on Monday when we did this visit, and the first thing he says to me, I thought it was going to be hard because we've been, he said, Jake, I'm so excited to see you. Will you forgive me? And I think the last one that really impacted me was, Jake, I know I wasn't there, but I'm amazed at how you turned out. And I'm thankful for it. It's not easy, but these pieces of the journey, if we allow the Holy Spirit to continually renew our mind, if we continually put ourselves in a place to offer ourselves as living and pleasing sacrifices, God is going to take us to the fulfillment of who we're meant to be as humans. 
which is love incarnate in all the places God has put us. That's my prayer for us as people, as individuals, as a community, that we would do that work, that our, our work in the world is to not do harm. It's also not to allow harm to happen to one another, to someone who is homeless or struggling with mental illness, to our families, to all those God has put in our path. As we finish, uh, I want us to, to celebrate communion together as a family, which is the ultimate vision of the fulfillment of the law. That Jesus with the power and the ability for people who he knew hated him, who he knew wanted him dead, says, I'm going to sacrifice my body to serve you, to love you, to care for you. That I'm going to do that. So he's with his family. And so I'm going to ask you to grab your communion elements, if you will. We're going to form our own family and we're going to stop sharing for a second. You can go to uh, keep it in speaker view for now. We'll go to gallery view in a second. But like, um, he had a piece of bread. And he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is what love of God looks like for you. When you take and you eat and you pass it, take and you eat, do so in remembrance of me and of this work and of a broken body blessed for the world to be shared, to be given, to be agape loved always. And he had a cup filled with wine and he poured it and he passed it. He said, this is my blood spilled for you. Jake, for you, insert your own name to end the cycle of retributive violence, to not pick up a sword, to transform minds and hearts. That agape love is the fulfillment of the human destiny. And in doing so, Jesus was the first, that's why Richard Rohr calls him proto-human, or the first human to live out how we were meant to live. And by doing so, we get the power and the strength along with the Holy Spirit's work in us to do the same. And so he said, take and drink and remember a different way of living in the world. All right, so if you would, switch to gallery view so we can see each other and do as much of this communally as possible in the middle of a global pandemic. I, I see all of you amazing people. If you would, raise your bread. You will kind of see it in the picture as much as possible. You can scroll to the left and to the right. You can see more. I see Sierra. Hi, Sierra. Hi, Sierra. I got her bread. All right. This is the body broken for you, my fam. Take and eat and remember the beauty of this meal. And then there was a cup. So hopefully you have some version of a cup. Uh, it could be water. It could be, it doesn't have to be, I mean, what, what Jesus was using was wine, which was the symbol of life. I saying, this is new life. This is my blood poured out for you. Take and drink. And when you do so, remember me. And let's do so together. Eat and drink. Uh, hold them up. See each other. Uh, you can celebrate if you want to. Clap, finger clap. Give them a big thumbs up to everybody else in the middle of that. I'm going to celebrate communion with you as well. What a powerful meal to always remember. And so I want to take you to take this with you this week. That every time you eat bread, every time you drink wine, Every time you have water, whatever you're having right now, remember the agape love of God and the Holy Spirit's work to transform you into pouring that out wherever God has put you. We're going to get a chance to sing and pray together a beautiful song um, that kind of finishes our time. So Jenny, if you would take over for us, let's sing and pray together.
Can you hear me now? Nice. All right, guys. This song is Enseñame Amar, and it translates to show us how to love. Um, so it's all in Spanish, but of course, uh, lyrics are always up for you guys. Always welcome to feel the Holy Spirit and inviting you to also sing as well so we can be able to sing and live out the word that God <laughs> gave us through Jake um, and also through this song. Amen. invite you as we finish to go to gallery view so if you can go up into the corner you can click on it up here but I think it's so important to see this this amazing group of people who God has given us and you can scroll through to the left or to the right um, and you can see folks but what a beautiful body of people that I want to just prayerfully send into the world as these beautiful living sacrifices of love, of grace, this living out of the communion table, blessed and broken in all the places that God has put us. Our worship language needs to change so that we understand that every second, everywhere God has put us is worship. That every decision the Holy Spirit is at work in all of those different places uh, so let me finish with this uh, again from Romans 12, where, where our, our 
brother, early Christian brother Paul, makes this move as he wrote to these real life people struggling with real life issues in Rome. After the first 11 chapters of beautiful of how much God loves you and God's grace and mercy, he says, therefore, first prayers, I urge you, my siblings, in view of God's love for you, in view of God's mercy for you, in view of all that Jesus did around this communion table, lived out and demonstrated and went through in terms of also conquering death, to offer this day your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is our actual spiritual action of worship. We love God by loving those around us well, as a choice, as agape, of being relentlessly committed to doing no harm, of relentlessly committed to a debt that we will never be able to fully repay, of continuing to love one another, and as, prior, and as finally a fulfillment of all that God wrote in here, said, love is the fulfillment of this. So my family, my encouragement and my prayer comes from the Apostle Paul to go and do likewise. And to go and do likewise. Holy Spirit, I am praying you would empower us to be living sacrifices, beautifully created and made, loving fully in your agape sense, the way that you modeled Jesus in all the places that you put us, in all the arenas.